I'm Liz Fawbless and this is Currents. David beats Goliath as a small Catholic-based business wins a court injunction against the contraception mandate. Plus, Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens tackles the lack of affordable housing. We're there to really help you uh, become as self-actualized as you can be as a family unit or as an individual. And a theater group in Belrose takes the stage and looks to come up big. It really connects different generations and creates a real community of them working together. Good evening and thank you for joining us. William, Paul, and James Newland and Christine Keterhagen. Up until this past weekend, those names may not have garnered much attention. The people I just named were among the many plaintiffs waiting on a court to decide whether a mandate that forces employers, regardless of their religious or moral convictions, to provide insurance coverage for abortion-inducing drugs, sterilization, and contraception under threat of heavy penalties violates the free exercise of religion. Well, today the Newlands are the subject of a groundbreaking decision. The Colorado-based Catholic Owners of Hercules, a heating and ventilation and air conditioning company, was awarded the first ever order against the controversial mandate. Alliance Defending Freedom, the firm that filed the lawsuit on behalf of the family, says more than anything, its clients won the right to run their company in a manner that reflects their sincerely held religious beliefs, including their belief that God requires respect for the dignity of human life and sexuality. I spoke more about that ruling with Matt Bowman, attorney for Alliance Defending Freedom, earlier today. Now, Matt, we are talking about the first ever court order against the mandate on behalf of Hercules Industries and the Catholic family that owns it. Now, to be clear, ADF is still in court challenging the mandate, but explain exactly what this decision means for Hercules. What's at stake in this case is whether every American, including family business owners, will be free to live and do business according to their faith. Now, this is the first court not only to issue an injunction, but the first court to rule in any way on the religious freedom question of whether the government can use Obamacare to stifle the very freedom that it's sworn to protect. And what happened in this case is this Catholic family that has run this business for over 50 years in Colorado and has treats its employees very well, uh, just didn't want to have to choose between their faith and their way of earning a living mm -hmm. when they ran their uh, in employee insurance plan. And what, uh, what the judge said in this case is that the interest that the government was claiming to justify their attack on religious freedom, those interests, quote, pale in comparison, unquote, to the infringement of a family's religious freedom. Right, right. And, and I want to actually, in keeping with that line of reason, I do want to focus on the language in the ruling because this really sets a critical precedent. Now, the government's arguments are saying that they're countered and indeed outweighed by the public interest in the free exercise of religion, as you mentioned, an issue that is being argued right now, Matt, as you know, in dozens of cases. You have other cases pending, so I understand you can't discuss the details, but this surely must bode well for the other cases. It certainly does. Again, this is the first judge to consider the question of can this uh, HHS HHS mandate through Obamacare, can it be used to uh, attack religious freedom in really uh, a, a way that disregards the principles of religious freedom that our country was founded on? That's what all of the different kinds of people in these cases have been upset about, that the government is imposing this mandate through Washington bureaucrats really in a disrespectful way towards religious freedom. And what the judge did in this case is he reined it in. He said no. The government has to pass the highest level of, of legal test if it's going to burden religious freedom in our nation, and it doesn't even come close to passing that test in this case. This Catholic family has as much right to practice their religious beliefs as anyone else, and the government cannot choose, uh, force them to choose between their mm -hmm. faith and earning a living, or really uh, can't force anyone to choose between their faith and serving their community. Now, quick reaction from you, Matt. The lawsuit, Newland versus Sibelius, was filed on April 30th in U.S. District Court for the District of Colorado. Were you surprised by how quickly the case was settled and like right before the August 1st implementation of this law? Well, we had asked for the court to rule this fast, and we were very grateful that the judge took a very thoughtful approach. He had been reading briefs on this case 
uh, for two months, really, since June when we started filing these. But after that thoughtful approach of his, after he had had an oral argument where I went to Colorado and Alliance Defending Freedom uh, argued in open court on this question, he decided that at the end of the day, uh, these, these immense, these crippling penalties against this family business, just because uh, they don't want the federal government to force them to violate their faith, uh, those outweigh the these alleged interests that the government has in disregarding religious freedom. Now, Matt, as you know, two other cases have been dismissed on the grounds that they did not make a case that the government's health care law will have an adverse effect. Now, with the understanding that all these cases may differ from state to state and that there is a subjective nature to the lawsuits in terms of large companies versus individuals, what was it specifically about Hercules and the Newlands that solidified this decision in your favor? Well, what people don't know about those other two cases is those judges never ruled on the religious freedom question. All they said was, you filed your case too early, come back next year. But in this case, the federal government was admitting that it was going to crack down on the faith practice of the Newland family because they were in a business. They're not nonprofits. They're a family business. And so the judge said, all right, you don't have to come back next year. We need to decide now can the federal government use Obamacare to crush the religious freedom that it's supposed to be protecting? And his initial reaction is, no, it can't. Matt, can you quantify for us exactly what the financial burden the Newlands were expecting had this decision not gone in their favor? Yeah, this, this is a, a, an extremely burdensome law on the practice of faith and religion. It would have fined the Newland family $100 per day per employee, and they have uh, over 250 employees, uh, it would have fined them and subjected them to lawsuits solely because they provide generous compensation to their employees. They provide a generous health plan with generous benefits for pregnancy and women's wellness. They just don't want to include abortion-inducing drugs and contraception in the plan, and it was going to uh, force the Newlands to choose between two poison pills, either abandon their faith or be subject to these massive and intense penalties. And that's why Alliance Defending Freedom came alongside the Newland family for free to represent them in this case. And if people want to learn more about it, they can go to our website, alliancedefendingfreedom.org, to learn more about this case and how they might be able to support our work. All right, Matt, thank you very much. That's the perfect last word. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm pretty sure we're probably going to be talking to you again sometime in the near future. But thank you for your time today. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, the court order is limited to Hercules and does not relieve other family businesses or the many religious nonprofits with moral objections from having to comply with this mandate's burden. Stay tuned. The day's top headlines are next. Welcome back to Currents. In tonight's headlines, the church reacts to an aggressive increase of AIDS in the Philippines. A top church advisor, Monsignor Robert Vitello, says that the spread of AIDS must be treated in a manner that puts human dignity above all else. In an interview with CNA last week, Vitello said that in the Philippines, as in all countries of the world, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church has focused on the dignity of the human person and on the responsibility that such dignity entails in caring for oneself and all other persons. He also said that the church's teachings about sexual activity, quote, should be received and understood in the context of responsible personal relationships and not simply as a public health instruction for one or other population group. Now, the church is trying to help control the epidemic with advice in terms of sexual behaviors and drug usage, as well as spiritual support. Also abroad, there is some fear that the ongoing violence in Syria may result in the Pope having to cancel his trip to Lebanon. Rome Reports has more on that. The now year-long conflict in Syria has resulted in an estimated 17,000 people killed and 120,000 refugees. Those who flee mostly go to Lebanon, Turkey and Jordan. The Catholic aid organization Caritas Internationales is one of the largest non-governmental organizations helping these people by providing food, shelter and medicine. The Secretary General Michael Roy says the situation of Syria is being made worse by arms being brought in from the outside. Right now, um, we are in full war, and this war is fueled mainly by arms being brought to the rebels and the oppositions from outside. 
and this is not the way to bring peace to that country. There has also been the worry that the spreading violence could cause the Pope to cancel his trip to Lebanon in September. It's expected to be a landmark trip for the different churches in the region, as well as the church's relation with the Arab world. If the war uh, develops, which is the case right now, and I don't think it will stop very easily, um, there is already war in the northern part of Lebanon where the Sunni and the Alawi people live. You know, the border between Syria and uh, Lebanon on the, on the Mediterranean um, uh, is a border between people of the same uh, tribes. There are also many Iraqi refugees living in Syria that are now returning home after facing a new wave of violence. Over the last years, Caritas Syria has been very active with Iraqi refugees coming from Iraq and staying in Syria or going to the West. A new team has been put in place with uh, emergency response programs from January onwards. The situation still carries many question marks for Syrians and their neighbors. In the meantime, Caritas Internationales continues to offer help to the thousands of refugees that continue to flee. And in Russia, punk singers face trial for causing a disruption in a cathedral. The three female band members were arrested back in March after they held an unauthorized performance in Moscow's Orthodox Cathedral. Now, During their show at the Altar of Christ, the Savior Cathedral, they shocked churchgoers with vulgar language. If convicted, the three punk singers could face seven years in prison. And finally tonight, a couple is denied their big day due to their race. CNN has details. Why didn't those people stand up in the beginning? If it was such a minority of people, why didn't the majority stand up and say, in God's house, we don't do this? Charles Wilson and his wife, Tiandria, are angry because of what happened two days before their wedding. Some of the members of the congregation got upset and decided that no black couple would ever be married at their church. First Baptist Church in Crystal Springs, Mississippi has never had an African-American wedding in its 129-year history. This was, had, not, had never been done here before, so it was setting a new precedence, and there were those who reacted to that. The church's pastor, Stan Weatherford, told Jackson, Mississippi TV station WLBT it was a small yet vocal group, and he did what he thought was best by asking the Wilsons to take their wedding elsewhere. But I didn't want to to have a controversy within the church, and I certainly didn't want a controversy to affect the wedding. Weatherford married the couple at a nearby church. I had dreams of having my wedding the way I wanted it, and I also dreamed of having it at the church. Mm. And unfortunately, it didn't happen. Some congregants said they hope the Wilsons and the church can move on. I would say I'm sorry this happened, and uh, would you forgive the people who caused it? because we're going to try to. As for the Wilsons, T. Andrea has been a member of First Baptist for more than a year. Charles said he was looking forward to joining, but now they don't feel welcome or at home. All we wanted to do in the eyes of God was to be man and wife in a church that we thought we felt loved. Stay tuned. More Currents after the break. Coming up, the need for affordable housing has never been greater. We'll talk with top officials at Catholic Charities about this looming crisis. I think we're unique amongst the many Catholic Charities in the country in mm -hmm. terms of developing such a vibrant housing arm, but we're very aware that we're a drop in the ocean in terms of the need. Welcome back. Well, the application process for the new Our Lady of Loretto Apartments in Brownsville is now closed. Catholic Charities sponsored the construction of these 45 units of affordable family housing. The problem is that 5,000 people applied for those apartments. These numbers show how dire the need for an affordable home is in New York City, said Monsignor Alfred Lapinto, vicar for human services in the diocese. Quote, unfortunately, the need for affordable housing far exceeds our resources. Catholic Charities cannot fulfill the demand at the capacity we'd like to. Our Lady of Loretto Family Apartments is designated for low-income families with preference given to residents in the immediate neighborhood. All applications 
conditions not fulfilled will be placed on a waiting list for future placement at this development. Now to talk more about the affordable housing crunch in New York City, I spoke earlier today with Robert Siebel, the executive director of Catholic Charities for Brooklyn and Queens. Robert, Our Lady of Laredo Family Apartments, mm -hmm. 45 beautiful facilities, 5,000 applications. If this right. does not speak to the need, I don't know what does. Can you, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about first what the apartments are like? The apartments, first of all, they're newly built and uh, the apartments are one and two bedrooms, Liz. Um, and it can, uh, you know, a persons occupying can be from one to uh, families of four. Mm -hmm. And the income uh, level uh, is anywhere from 24000 as an annual income to as high as uh, 48000 And how do you vet the application process? Like who goes through the applications and, and decides who actually is, is capable of or? All right. Essentially, it's, it's as received. We, it's, it's picking out of a drum. Okay. It's, it's arbitrary in that respect. And then uh, it's the staff of uh, Catholic Charities that then goes through, given the income criteria, mm -hmm. who is eligible, who isn't. And you go as really as far as you need to go, because we're not going to go through 5,000 at this point for 45 units. Mm -hmm. But we do keep each catalog numerically. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, the apartments don't turn over. Talk uh, to us about the resources versus the amount of apartments that are now available and that are now needed. I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. there is a very huge disparity. Oh, How do you deal with that? You know, we've, we've, uh, we've done 44 different projects since we founded our housing development arm in the mid-70s. And each of them, be they for seniors or families or persons with special needs, each has a waiting list somewhere between 500 and 1,000. And we cut it off because it's not likely you're going to get mm -hmm. an apartment after that. Uh, but we know. We know from our, our community centers. We know uh, from our home-based program, which we do. We try to keep people out of shelters through that mm -hmm. program. But the numbers are enormous. Our, our home base, for instance, where people can get of assistance, they're kind of on the edge, you know, in terms of losing where they're going to be. Um, and we work with them in a variety of different ways to, to make sure that doesn't happen. But last month we had 2,800 calls for that service. Um, and that's, that's astronomical. So you get a sense. I mean, it's the economy. It's, it's uh, most people, so many families spending well more than 50% of their income on housing mm -hmm. when 30% is really the norm. Um, the the ten percent uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, jobs uh, in in the city of New York unemployment mm -hmm. in the city of New York uh, the foreclosure uh, phenomenon that we've gone through in mm -hmm. the past uh, two years and all of that tremendous disruption tremendous need and Catholic Charities is at the foundation of, of so many need based yes, types right. of, of sure. organizations sure. you have senior centers you have youth organizations right. how much of a priority now is based on housing housing has always been uh, a top priority for Catholic Charities uh, I think we're unique amongst the many Catholic Charities in the country in mm -hmm. terms of developing such a vibrant housing arm but we're very aware that we're a drop in the ocean in terms of the need um, and, you know, we, we, we uh, uh, not only Loretto, we have another project in Howard Beach right now, which will be for senior citizens and for uh, seniors who have developmentally disabled uh, children or, or uh, relatives. And uh, so we're very excited about that. But there, too, I know the minute we get into the whole uh, who gets these apartments mm -hmm. is going to be tremendous demand. Now, your goal over a, a certain number of years was 3,500 units. Right. Is, is that still the goal? How, how close are we to that? And We've achieved what, the goal. You have yeah, achieved the goal. And, uh, so where do we go from we're here? We're just going to keep on doing as, as much as we can do uh, in terms of, of housing. Uh, I think what's unique, though, about charities housing is that we couple it with social services mm -hmm. so that when you come into, if you're having problems with a job or you're having problems with the education of your kids or kids in general, any, anything, we're there to really help you uh, become as self-actualized as you can be as a family unit or as an individual. Now here's the thing though, Catholic Charities, right. as, as wonderful as it is and as much help as it provides, y you can't do it no, alone. Right. Uh, 
are you seeking more funding? Are you seeking more mm -hmm. help from the city? And, and how are you going about doing that? Uh, well, unfortunately, funding uh, on a governmental level is being pared back all over the place, so we're trying to hold our own. Okay. Uh, we certainly have tremendous advocacy going on around all of those issues, and many of those advocates are in partnership with parishes, quite frankly, uh, who really do a lot and work with us uh, to advocate for just social policy, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic. And the parishes, too, have developed with us a tremendous network, say, of just food uh, pantries and some of the basics that people need to get through the day. Uh, so I think we're looking to stre strengthening those, those partnerships with parish and community, mm -hmm. uh, and then certainly looking to our donor base and expanding that, which we've been fairly successful in doing. And who is your donor base? Uh, well, it was five or six years ago. Uh, the mid was 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 some uh, was a w woman, mm -hmm. usually uh, widowed, and usually somewhere in her mid seventies. And we're very happy to have them. They've okay. been a tremendous. But we've diversified. Uh, we have a Catholic alumni network from all the different colleges represented mm -hmm. by graduates in Brooklyn, Queens, and elsewhere, and that's expanding. And as is the donor base. Obviously, like others, we've gone online and online giving and our website and all of those kinds of things to really try to engage people in what we're doing and become partners with us in trying to meet human need. And how do you suggest people get in touch with you? What's the best way? How do you help? How do you enc encourage new donors to come forward? Yeah, certainly our website gives you all kinds of ways of, of interacting uh, with the agency and donating. Uh, we also have a tremendous volunteer program at this point, which I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, what we have volunteer orientations and placements at uh, one of our 160 programs throughout Brooklyn and Queens. Okay. That's a really good way of getting a taste of what it, what we're trying to to uh, accomplish, and helping us with your talents, really, to help accomplish right. that. So people are doing tremendous things. English as a second language, okay. becoming mentors for kids tutors for kids, uh, uh, volunteering on our senior centers. A great our, well of opportunity. Yes, there really is, and, and, it's, and it's very affirming. Okay. Uh, you talk to volunteers, they feel so uh, wonderful and, and feel nurtured by the whole experience. I could only know. imagine, yeah. I could only imagine, and I do hope through this interview, at least, that we get a lot more donors to forward the uh, mission of Catholic I Charities. Certainly hope Thank so. you so much, Robert, Thank you, Liz, it's here. been a pleasure. And stay with us. More Currents after the break. When we return, a church theater group prepares for their big summer production. People from 5 years old to 85 years old get together for about two and a half months and put on something great. And now to community building of a different kind. For the past 33 years, the kids and adults of St. Gregory the Great Parish in Belrose, Queens have been singing and dancing their ways into the hearts of SRO audiences. Better known as the SGTG Theatre Group, the parish-based company is currently in final rehearsals for their production of Big, the musical. Before the curtain goes up this weekend, the group is fine-tuning its skills and we sent our cameras there to take a look. are right now at the St. Gregory's Theatre and we are right now rehearsing for the um, SGTG performance of Big the Musical. We're doing the musical, Big, Big the Musical, and the way I think it's unique is it really connects different generations and creates a real community of them working together to create something special and fun and magical. It's just an amazing story about a kid who wishes that he was big and he wishes on a machine and he becomes big. And he has to, at the end, he has to decide if he wants to end up as a grown-up or he wants to be a kid. And I, I think most of our shows, I would have to say, he does a beautiful job of connecting all of the actors with the designers, with the production members to really work together as a team and a community. I'm I'm doing a lot. I'm in the first I'm in the first scene. I do hula hooping with my friend Hannah. The coolest part of the musical is the big piano. It's cool because you don't know anyone. Like I'm from Mineola, so it's definitely 
I get to meet everyone from Belrose, from everyone all around, so that's definitely a lot of fun. My favorite part of the show is all the dancing with my friends. Dances. Dances. Dancing. The dancing. The dances. The dances. Yeah, the dances. This theater group is called uh, St. Gregory Theater Group, SGTG. We've been around since 1979. We do two shows a year, a big musical. And, uh, and uh, in the winter, we actually do a, a comedy or a drama. <laughs> and you know what? From my point of view, it's a ministry where a community, a very unique community, where people from five years old to 85 years old get together for about two and a half months and put on something great for the people, not only in this community, but people in Long Island and the people in Manhattan and the Five Barrels. Really fun. The musicals are really, really great, and I love all the songs and the dance moves. Please come to the musical Big. Actually, it's Big the Musical. We open Friday, August 3rd. It's going to be special and magical. Come, come see it. And Big the Musical opens this weekend with performances on Friday and Saturday at 8 p.m. and a 2 p.m. matinee on Sunday. Now, if you can't get there this weekend, you can catch it on special weeknight and weekend performances next week, August 8th through the 12th. For tickets and more information, go to www.sgtg.org. That's it for tonight. Be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Fobulous. And as we leave tonight, we have more rehearsal scenes from St. Gregory the Great's production of Big the Musical. Mm -hmm.